bring it up up there. Second Corinthians chapter four. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse fifteen through eighteen. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse fifteen through eighteen. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Amen. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, look to someone say just a moment, just a moment. worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen. I want you to look to somebody and say, hang in there. Amen. Hang in there. Brother Shannon, would you pray with them? Has anybody here ever been to a rodeo? Yes. All right, got a few cowboys and cowgirls in here. Amen. I've never been to one. I've been wanting to go. We was just talking about that. We've got sights to right down the road. And, and, uh, and, and the reason, so I, I've never been to one, but I recall uh, being at a friend's house and seeing it on, on the TV for the first time. I remember being mesmerized. Uh, and then I remember another time of being glued to the TV at a doctor's office. Now, don't act like you've never done that before. Right. But that thing would be on you. And and, and, the, and I was just mesmerized because bull riding has got to be one of the most exciting sports in the world. And, and I know some won't agree with that, but um, but it's certainly, and I think we can all agree that it's certainly one of the most dangerous yes. sports. And to me, that's why it's so exciting. <laughs> I just get a kick out of it. And the, those bull riders are either tough crazy or maybe they're both but i there's no way that i get on one of those bulls no way and uh, um, they're facing down a 2,000 pound bull and that's got to be intimidating and uh, i read that once a bull rider settles himself on the back of that animal and ties his hand and, and that's man there ain't no way i tie myself to it that's crazy and uh, and some of y'all thinking this sounds like my marriage uh, but tied into the rope which, one of his buddies will say to him, hang in there. That, that's, that's the title of my message tonight. But as I was reading this article, I thought it was very interesting that as he ties his hand to this bull, he looks to his buddy, and, and I noticed that there's always somebody back there with him, and his friend to say to him, hang in there. And with that and an affirmative nod from the rider, the chute opens, and out into the arena charges the raging bull and rider. And the rider grips the bull rope with one hand and holds his other hand high in the air. And the crowd of spectators scream, hang in there, hold on. As the rider puts forth his best effort to become the master of the eight second challenge. It takes more than desire and encouragement from the spectators. Yes. However, for that rider to stay on the bull. Amen. Bull riding requires skill, balance, flexibility, and coordination. It takes determination, and it takes courage. In fact, bull riding is where the phrase, hang in there, originated from. I have found that life can be a lot like bull riding. How about you? One huge difference, though, is that it is more than a mere eight-second challenge. Amen. If our challenges just came in eight-second verse, that'd be all right, but it's never like that. Life can buck you around pretty hard and will oftentimes throw you hard to the ground. And like that nasty old bull, life will oftentimes gouge you and stomp you further into the ground that you fell upon. Perhaps there is no one more qualified to teach us how to hang in there than the Apostle Paul. He endured some of the greatest hardships for a Christian that life could conjure up. Both the Jews and the Gentiles hated him. He was misunderstood and attacked by other Christians. He was shipwrecked three times. He was beaten with 39 stripes six times. He was stoned and left for dead three times. And you thought you had a bad. Paul learned the secret of how not to get thrown off this bull we call life. He knew how to hang in there. 
In verse 1 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says simply, we faint not. The Amplified Version says we do not get discouraged, spiritless and despondent with fear, or become faint with weariness and exhaustion. The New Living Translation says we never give up. The NIV states we do not lose heart. The message says we're not about to throw up our hands and walk off the job just because we ran into occasional hard times. I need somebody in this place right now, amen, to testify to the fact that sometimes life gets hard, but I'm not about to give up. I'm hanging in there. I'm preaching to somebody tonight who just sit down onto the back of that bull called hard times in life, and you need to hear the familiar phrase, hang in there. Somebody needs to hear this. Don't get discouraged. Don't lose heart and never give up. Hang in there because we're not about to throw up our hands and walk away from this Christian life just because we hit hard times. We're in this together and together we're going to make it. Amen. The first secret to hanging in there is serving without notoriety. And the motivation for service is God's love and His mercy. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4 and 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Today's English version says, God in His mercy has given us work to do. Amen. Listen, we don't serve because we're commanded to serve. We get to serve God. And I don't know about you, but it's the greatest thing I've ever done. I'm so glad for the privilege of getting to serve God. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm just excited to know that God woke me up this morning to serve. Amen. Paul lets us know in verse 5 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that servants never focus on themselves. He said we preach not ourselves. Rather, a servant focuses on the one they serve. The job of a servant is to make the one they serve look good. Paul said in verse 11, our lives are at constant risk for Jesus' sake, which makes Jesus' life all the more evident in us. Service never strives for the applause of men. The goal of a servant is to hear his master say, well done. And I look forward to hearing him say, well done. 2 Corinthians 4 and 6 says, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Let me ask you tonight, what's more important to you, the container or the contents of the container? According to Paul, we're just containers. That's what he means by earthen vessels vessels. Listen, self-worth does not come from your talents or your abilities. It comes from the treasure that you carry within. We are entrusted with the most precious treasure this world has ever known. The light of the gospel of Christ, the Holy Ghost. I am so glad that I've been filled with His Spirit. I'm so glad for the Holy Ghost to be in my life. I submit to you that the times you become most discouraged are those times when you allow yourself to focus on your flawed container instead of the treasure that's in it. I wish somebody tonight would recognize that truly greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. Don't get down on yourself because of what it looks like on the outside, but rather get excited because God is living on the inside. It's easy to get discouraged about what's going on out here, but tonight I choose to be encouraged about what's from the outside, it don't look like much. But let me tell you, it's like fire shut in my bones. I don't always feel good out here. But on the inside, it always feels good. I've got joy in the Holy Ghost, but I can't find it anywhere else. When I find just discouragement and, 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 and reason to be sad out here, I look inward to the hope of the world. When you focus on yourself, Rather than on the light of the Holy Ghost which is in you, you're going to become discouraged. And you're going to become disappointed. 
And thankfully, the treasure contained in us is not diminished one bit by the imperfected, imperfect condition of this container. Your life may be marred and stained by sin, but it does not lessen the value of the treasure you carry. If you simply remember what is contained within you, you will never faint. Amen. I, I, I just want us to get rid of yesterday. So many of us can continue to talk about our discouraged uh, uh, life that, that was behind us and all the things we've been through and all the temptations that, that we have faced through life and are still facing today and I wish we could just throw all that away and look inward to the hope that God has put inside of you and realize that you really can make it. If you continue to dwell on your problems it's only going to get worse. If you continue to dwell on what's tempting you and what keeps causing you to trip up and fall you're going to keep falling. But if you'll look deep inside and realize that God is rooting for you and He wants you to carry on, somebody ought to let go of yesterday and proclaim loudly, today is the day of salvation. Right now, I give myself to you, God. Right now, I choose to be everything you called me to be. Amen. You will never become discouraged and you will never lose heart and you will never up if you remind yourself every day that you are just the container, flawed and marred, but what is inside of me is the greatest thing that can be found in this world. I'm a vessel of the Holy Ghost. Is there anybody in this place that is excited and glad to be a vessel of the Holy Ghost? It's not about me, it's not about you, it's all about Him and I'm so glad for it. The second secret to hanging in there is that you must surmount the insurmountable. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 8 through 9 says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Boy, it takes a real person of God to be able to say, I got trouble everywhere, but I'm not distressed. And I, there, there's nothing better than being able to tell somebody that's not a believer. And I know you see all this trouble I'm going through, but guess what? I'm not stressed out at all because God's got it. I wish somebody would praise God because you know that He's got it in His hands. You could have walked in here tonight with a frown. You could have walked in here sad and troubled. Amen. You've got trouble all around you. And in this world you've got reason to pout and doubt. Amen. But us inside of here know the power of the Holy Ghost. And I've come to tell you tonight, don't be distressed. We're perplexed, but don't be in despair. I know you've been persecuted, but guess what, honey? You've not been forsaken, and you never will be. Cast down, but you're still here. You're not destroyed. You're going to make it. I still got a container. I can still hold Jesus. I still got the Holy Ghost. I've got holes in my pocket, but I don't got holes in my soul. God's in there, and it's holding up. Hang in there. Amen. We've been surrounded and battered by troubles. But we're not demoralized. We're not sure what to do all the time, but we know that God knows what to do. We've been spiritually terrorized, but God hasn't left our side. We've been thrown down, but we have not been broken. If Paul had focused only on the challenges of the ministry, he would have been overwhelmed and he would have thrown in the towel. Instead, he focused on the power of God. Instead, he focused on God's power to carry him through those challenges, realizing that his own abilities were hugely inadequate. Amen. If I focused on myself and focused on what I could do, I'd have done quit preaching because I realized that I fall so short. But I realized that it's God that's preaching. It's God that's ministering. And I'm just a vessel. I'm just a mouthpiece for the great I am. And that's why every time I get up to preach, I say, God, please use me. And why me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet because without you I can't do it but God with you amen we're going to blow the gates of hell open and we're going to take back everything the devil stole from us by myself I can't heal but God if you'll lay me I'll lay hands and we'll see the blind and see again amen the death will hear again amen I wish somebody in this place would leave because you know what God has put down his sign is the greatest thing you can ever possess. I'm excited because I can be down today, but I can get right back up and hold the 
every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. There are three pipelines through which God's power flows into us. Somebody say praise. praise. Somebody say prayer. prayer. And somebody say proclamation. proclamation. Amen. Through praise, prayer, and proclamation. Paul praised God in the rough times as well as the peaceful times. Paul petitioned God in prayer when he needed strength. And Paul proclaimed the gospel of Christ as he recounted often his testimony of transformation on the Damascus road. Sure, there were days that he didn't feel worthy to carry the gospel. Surely there were days that he was inadequate. But he got up and he praised God. He got up and he prayed. And he went on preaching. He went on teaching and he went on telling everybody what God can do. Oh, I even know better now what God can do because I've been down and he got me back up. I've fallen into sin, but he washed me by his blood. I almost gave up, but God said, get your chin up and hang in there. There's nothing greater than knowing that God is shouting from the balcony of heaven. Church, get up. Church, hang in there. In doing so, you continually surmount the insurmountable. The third and final secret to hanging in there is to see the unseen. Look to the person beside you say, I'm going to see the unseen. 2 Corinthians 4 and 17 through 18 says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The key then to hanging in there is not to focus on your present problems, but rather to dwell on things that are eternal. I feel like I need to say that again. The key then to hanging in there is not to focus on your present problems, but rather to dwell on things that are eternal. 
things that are unseen. The things that discourage us the most are, are, are generally not the things that happened in the past and neither is it the thing that may happen in the future. The thing that bothers us the most is that which is happening right now. But when I think of God's goodness and mercy and how He is working in my life right now, it makes me want to shout hallelujah. It makes me want to shout praise God. right now, but when I think of his goodness, when I think of how he's always brought me out, when I think about how faithful he is, it makes me want to clap, it makes me want to leap, and it makes me want to dance. Amen. Listen to the word of God speaking to your life tonight. Somebody ought to get glad and be glad and happy in knowing that God's got it. Somebody shout, hang in there. Philippians 1 verse 6 being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you amen God is the finisher amen he's begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ Romans 8 and 28 says and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose Philippians 2 and 13 says for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure Colossians 1 and 29 says whereunto I also labor striving according to his working. Amen. Which worketh in me mightily. Hebrews 13 and 21 says God is working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Think for a moment about the day when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. You'll know that he told those who were there to move the stone away from the tomb. Consider too that the day that, that Jesus turned the water into wine. He told the servants to fill the pots with water. But never forget this very important fact. It was the Lord who raised Lazarus from the dead. And it was the Lord who turned the water into wine. The real secret to hanging in there is realizing that he only expects you to do what you can. And then trust him to do what you cannot. I want to say that again. Only thing that God expects you to do is what you can do and then to trust Him with what you cannot do. If you feel like you have been on the back of a bull and you're ready for some relief, do what you know is the right thing to do. Hold on and wait for His deliverance. Amen. He'll make a way where there seems to be no way. Do what you can and know to do and then expect God to do what you cannot do. Amen. Scripture tells us that our part is repentance and obedience. Acts 2 and 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. God just expects you to repent and be obedient. I'm so glad that I've been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and filled with the Holy Ghost. And now I trust God to do the rest. I'm going to show up to church with my praise on. I'm going to show up to church and I'm going to worship I'm going to be faithful and giving, and I'm going to be a servant. And I'm going to sit back and watch God do the rest because He's always faithful. Somebody ought to praise God right now, and God's going to begin to do the rest. I wish all over this place people would begin to proclaim that God has got this in His hands. And so I'm just going to clap my hands because God's got His hands busy working for me. Amen. What do you do when God? control. Amen. You don't got anything else in your hands, so you praise God with them. You go and pray for somebody. You stir the waters because God's got it. It's only right that we praise God. He's doing all the hard work. He's filling you out and taking care of you. And if He's took it out of your hands, then what are your hands going to do? It's only right that if God your hands. You ought to use your hands to praise Him. He's only right. And you don't got to cry out and shout at your enemy all the time. 
So instead, I'm going to use my feet to run to Jesus. Amen. I love it. When we're singing a song and somebody just takes off running around the church. Amen. There's nothing like letting the devil know I'm not running from you. I'm running on top of you. I'm not running from you. I'm running to Jesus. Amen. I'm telling you the devil is afraid when you put it in God's hands. You want to scare the devil and give it to God. Amen. I went a long time ago. I don't got to be afraid to pray. I've seen it like Brother Mark said to attack exactly what I prayed about. And I've learned to pray in tongues over some things. Amen. But, 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 but understand that even if the devil knows, amen, what's going to trouble you. And the devil knows how to turn your life upside down. But I feel like telling somebody it doesn't matter. Hang in there because in the end, God's still going to give you victory. And it's so what if you pray for your car and it broke down even worse? God's going to give you a new one if you just hang in there. Just praise him. Don't be afraid of the devil messing with your blessing because you prayed. Don't let the devil get in the way of you and praying to God. Don't be fearful. Be excited because you're just, I love to make the devil mad. I love to stir him up. Amen. God has got this. There's nothing like stirring up the devil. Yeah, you'll get mad and he'll we'll sting you a few times. you're going to make it. You might get hurt, but you're going to make it. I wish somebody that's going through a hurt right now would realize that if I just hang on, I'm going to make it. I know you've been hurt. I'm sorry about it. I know the devil's used weapons against you, but let, let me just remind you that they're not going to work. It's not going to prosper. He may have touched your finances, but it can only be temporary because God's going to turn it around. That's why he said the first shall be last and the last shall be first. There's going to be a divine turnaround in your life if you'll just hold on, if you'll just hang on. The devil can only mess with it for so long until God breaks his hand and says, that's my child and you can't have him. Stand all over this place. I'm going to end up preaching another hour if I don't stop. Boy, I feel Jesus in this place. Hallelujah. I wonder if there's anybody that's not afraid to get up from where they are. Come up to this altar and just shout out. Amen. God, this is what I need. And just let them, don't be afraid of the devil in the theory. Don't be afraid of the devil trying to mess with it. Just say, God, this is what I need. I want it. It's mine. I know you've got my back. And just give God praise for it. Amen. We've got to praise Him. We've got to pray. And we've got to proclaim it. Amen, God. This is what I need. And then give Him praise. And then shout it out. It's mine. It's mine. I'm going to hang in there. I'm going to make it. I'm going to hang in there. My family will be saved. I'm going to make it. They're going to make their hanging in there. It's going to be all right. God's got it in His hands. It's going to be okay. We've been making it for a night. But joy coming in the morning. I may be hurting now. But God's fixing to touch me. And everything's going to be all right. Your heartache won't last always. God's healing your heart. And everything's going to be all right. That burning no more sting for a while. But God's going to take care of it. Me and Jamie first moved into our house. We had a bad wasp problem in the sheds that we were needing to store stuff in. Jesus, name. <laughs> Anybody ever been stung by a wasp? If you have, you never will be stung again. 
And so I had a fear because them wasps, I've been hurt by it before. And I got up there and seen them wasps. First thing I did was drop everything and took it back off in the house. It's not worth it. We just won't have a shed. Let the wasp have it. And then I thought, man, I'll miss out on all.